this for ASMR purposes. I'm hoping that you all still enjoy it. However, there was a lot of uh, request to, to come back to some nature of background for my videos. And there was a lot of people opposed to it as well. So I decided that starting today, I will record the video in front of the camera, but I will include a version that it will have the same audio, but with the visuals of the, the beach or, you know, some kind of nature kind of thing. So for those of you who enjoy that, you will have the same video in that format. And that way you can pick whatever you want. It will not be available as a video for you to watch because I don't want people to get confused on my channel. It will be an unlisted video, so if you don't want to watch this one where I'm talking to the camera, but you rather watch this video in a nature background or for visuals, then I'll have that video. It will be on the top of the screen. You can go and click on it and that card will take you straight to the video. If you can't find the card or something happens, there will be a link again to this exact same video with the visuals of nature in the comments down below and in the description box down below. Now, I hope that way that everyone gets a little bit of everything. I am trying something different. A lot of people said that there was a lot of light in some of my videos, so I'm trying to close all the blinds and uh, use the light from the camera. I don't know how it's going to work. It's probably going to be grainy because it's going to have uh, to put up a lot more light that it's actually not in the room, but uh, I guess I'm just experimenting and see what I can do with what I have. So today's video, it's going to be about uh, Rebecca Sao or Sao. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name. She is from the north west of Burma. So they, of course, the last names and some of the first names that I will mention here in this video, I am probably going to butcher them. However, this was a very requested video. This is technically an unsolved mystery because they don't have somebody in jail for what happened in this case. But regardless, it's a very, very sad story. And I thought that I would share with you all the research that I've done on it. Now, as I mentioned before, her name is Rebecca Sao, and she is from Balam, which is in, somewhere in the northwest part of Burma. Her father, her father's name is Guan Nin, and her mother is Sung Tin. She moved previously from Burma to Nepal and Germany. Uh, there is a lot of um, information out there that said that they had to leave their country to move to the States. But according to my research, they moved before to Germany and Nepal, or maybe they lived there briefly before moving to the States. Now, when they moved as a family to the United States, uh, most of the family stayed in the St. Jo Joseph, Missouri area. And uh, she, of course, this was, she moved 10 years before the tragedy that took her life. But in 2002, she married this guy. He was a nursing student. He was 36 years old, and his name is Neil Nalepa, which, by the way, sometimes you can find her story, to, and people refer to her as Rebecca Nalepa instead of Zhao. Now, um, she married him, but they got divorced in February of 2011. She then moved to California and she started working in uh, as an ophthalmologist assistant. She there met a guy that it was almost like, you know, love at first sight, if you can call it that. But they got very interested in each other. Um, so they started dating uh, and seeing each other almost immediately. Jonah is the guy that frequently this plays in, you know, she started a relationship with. He is the founder and the CEO of a pharmaceutical company that is not only very successful, but he is very well known. He 
first wife, I think he had two kids, and with the second wife, with her name is Dina, she had uh, her third child, and his name was Max. Um, Max was the one that apparently was uh, the kid that visited him the most, or at least the one that is talked more about in this story the most. Max and Rebecca, I mean, the relationship with Jonah and Rebecca was very, very serious, and Rebecca got to know Max very well, to the point that Max's mom, Dina, was a little bit jealous of that relationship that they had, uh, sometimes doing silly things and some kind of a jealousy thing that she would try to um, not let her see him that much just because of the great relationship that Rebecca had with Max. I can kind of understand that. somebody, you know, and they get into a new relationship, I think, in my opinion, it would be better to, to be in good terms with the other person, but I'm not saying that they weren't in good terms, I'm just saying that Tina had that kind of competition for the love of Max, and again, Max could have had a lot of fun with Rebecca, but I think that as a mother, I mean, you have a very tough job, you know, you're the one that wakes him up to go to school, and even if you're not the funnest person to be around, because again, you are the mom, uh, you know, it's like, you know, if you love your kids, they will love you back, and it's kind of an instinct, so I do not understand why it was uh, that rivalry uh, for Max's love, but that was something that was said, and that is something that popped up in every single article that I read about this story. Now, Rebecca, and Jonah lived uh, at Jonah's mansion, and the mansion had a name. The name is the Spreckles Mansion, and this is in Coronado, California, which is an island off San Diego, again, connected by a bridge to the San Diego area. Now, this island, it's kind of an exclusive place for people with a lot of money. I think that the cheapest house there, it's almost a million and a half. So, it's, it's for people that have a lot of money. In this particular mansion, I think it had, uh, or it has 27 rooms, bedrooms. That's, that's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I thought I should mention it. Sometimes you hear mansions uh, and stuff like that, and then you're wondering, you know, it's a big house. Well, this one, it was pretty big, and it also had a guest house, so if you didn't want to stay with in the main house, you could stay in the guest house. Okay, it's a long story, but you know why I mentioned this at the beginning. Now, on June 11th, Max was at his dad's house, and uh, his dad wasn't home. He was staying with Rebecca and her sister, uh, her younger sister. Her younger sister was visiting, actually, Rebecca, so she happened to be at the house. But Rebecca was in charge of Max. Now, all of a sudden, uh, Max uh, falls from the stairs balcony, I mean, there's the little rest area, and he fell from the second floor, so you have an idea, it was a pretty bad fall and very, very high. Of course, this is a mansion, of course, it has this big, beautiful stairs, but he fell from the second floor all the way down. Now, we know that he fell, or we know he ended up at the bottom, but we don't know what actually happened because Rebecca wasn't there at the time. She was in another part of the house, and her sister was in another part of the house. Now, when they heard the commotion and, you know, the, 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 the loud uh, noise, and probably he was crying or screaming as he was falling, they go to where Max was, and... Uh, Immediately, Rebecca asked her sister to call 911. While she was calling 911, Rebecca was giving CPR to Max. So she didn't ask her sister because she didn't want to call. That is something that some people say, but it was actually because she was giving CPR to Max in order to try to help him while the ambulance got there. They took Max to the children's hospital in the area, and he, they treated him that they could. They had to put him in an induced coma because 
because of his injuries were really, really bad and they were trying to get a little bit of time to see what he could, they could do for him. Uh, at this point, the police is investigating this accident, but um, they think that he either tripped over a ball or he tripped over the dog and fell. That is initially because this is something that it's going to change. Another thing that I heard about this is that uh, one of the last things that Max said to uh, Rebecca, you know, after he fell, is Ocean. And Ocean was the name of the dog. So again, that information with uh, what the initial investigation revealed, almost like he draped over the dog. Now, while Max was at the hospital, a lot of family started coming to visit and of course they knew that he was in very critical condition so some people just wanted to go visit him to give you know, their final goodbyes or say their final goodbyes to Max. One of those was Jonah's brother and his name was Adam. Now on July 13, 2011, Adam was spending the night at Jonah's and Rebecca's house. Uh, apparently, Max's mother, uh, her sister, and Jonah himself, they were staying 24 hours in the hospital, which makes sense. But Rebecca did go back to the house. She actually went and dropped off her sister in at the airport and picked up um, Jonah's brother's uh, brother, Adam. Now, that night, uh, they went to the house, to the mansion, and Rebecca stayed and, of course, was going to stay in her room. But he decided to stay at the guest house. Now, when we wakes up the next morning, he found Rebecca's body hanging from the top floor by a red rope. He calls immediately 911, but it's interesting to know that at the beginning of the 911 call, he's like, hello, and it, my goodness, you have to listen to the 911 call to understand that he started that conversation. It was almost like he was calling somebody that he knew, and it wasn't a big deal. You know, it's like, okay, I'm just calling to report a dead deer on the side of the road. I don't know, that kind of thing. And maybe not even that, because I think that you'd feel a little bit bad about the deer on the side of the road, too. But this guy, he, I mean, he called in the first three words he said. He sounded very, very calm. But then, all of a sudden, he became a little bit um, agitated, and he seemed scared. And he actually told the 911 dispatcher that, um, you know, he found this girl. He said, as he, he said like this, I found this girl and she hung herself. Now that girl picked him up from the airport and has been dating the brother for some time now. So I don't understand why he would say a girl. You know, it's not like, okay, any girl just got in the house and, uh, you know, just hang herself or anything like that. But uh, the 911 dispatcher asked him, you know, uh, is she alive? she's alive so at that time he puts the phone down and he decides to go and check on her so he will pull her down he will cut the rope pull her down and try to see if he found any pulse or you know if she was breathing at all now he comes back to the line and asks the 911 operator are you sending somebody here and she keeps saying well i can't send anybody there if you don't give me the address apparently the guy didn't the address of his brother so when she asked the first time which is something that I forgot to mention he said I don't know then he proceeded to say well where you picked up the kid that, that fell from the stairs the other day and the, you know that kind of thing we're like okay this is a, a dispatcher on a 911 uh, but, but it doesn't mean that I'm the one that pick up every single call that was done from that area you know what I mean so he finally comes back, he asks, you know, is help coming? And they said, and she said, no, it's not because I don't know your address. He finally tells her it's 1043 Ocean Boulevard and he immediately gets transferred to the fire department. I don't know, protocol or anything like that, but he gets transferred to a new lady that basically asked the same questions and he answered them the same way. Now, again, he told her that uh, he didn't uh, feel any pulse or anything and that she had her uh, hands tied. 
side so he had to cut the rope in order or you know remove the knots whatever to untie her to try to feel the pull so he did pull her down and kind of messed up everything but it makes sense maybe she was alive and he was helping her so that that's something that you know it's not as unusual while this was happening jonah was at the hospital remember that most of them were uh, at the hospital including the mom and you know the closest family members because they knew that you know he was really really bad and apparently he was sleeping jonah was sleeping across the street in a ronald mcdonald roadhouse or something like that um now let's go back to what happened okay so adam calls him and tells him you know your your girlfriend just took her life she hanged herself at the house which by the way i felt so bad for that guy i mean you're not only losing your child in a very freak accident which by the way it's not uncommon it's something that happens it's not something that it show on the news but it's very very common to um sadly uh for a kid to have a very bad, bad accident even in their own home so jonah was going through this uh, um while adam was back dealing with the police and stuff like that now, when the police arrived there, there were quite a few things that look a little bit weird. Uh, number one, Rebecca's hands and feet were tied in the back, and she was gagged with a blue long sleeve t-shirt that was wrapped around her head with the sleeves. Um, it was double knotted and then stuffed in her mouth, and there was also tape residue in her legs. It's kind of looking a little bit more uh, of a foul play, in my opinion, at this point, than a suicide. Now, um, because of all this, it it made the police wonder if something different could have happened. When they explained the knot in the beginning, they said that the knot that she had in her hands wasn't very, very tight, so they thought that she did it to herself, but it's kind of interesting to think that you're going to take your own life. And again, something that it's very, very shocking is that she was also naked. So you're naked, you tie your hands, you tie your legs, you gag yourself, and then you hang yourself from the balcony of a guest room. So it's not even your room, which in my head, it doesn't really make sense. It almost feels like she was interrupted. Maybe she was changing into her clothes to go to sleep. Maybe she was taking a shower. Maybe she was doing something that she had to remove her clothes to do that. And she was maybe surprised. Maybe she heard a noise. Why would she be on a guest room when she has her own room in the mansion? So a lot of those things I'm sure the police wonder at the time. But um, the police did find a few things upon the first uh, investigation. They found her footprints and a man's boot footprint in her, the balcony where she was um, either thrown from, you know, if this was in fact that somebody killed her or where she killed herself. They also found two knives on the ground in that room where she was at. They found on a shelf in her room a book that the name is Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft. And in there, there was a page with a ritual that shows a naked woman. Uh, and this is a drawing. It's not actually a picture itself, but it was a drawing of a naked woman with her back, with her hands and her feet tied to the back and a red rope around her neck, which led people to believe or the police to believe at the time that maybe this was some kind of ritual or something. They also found a message painted in the back of the door of that guest room that said, she saved him, you can save her. That came that night. But again, he couldn't confirm that it was Dina, somebody that looked like Dina. Uh, so the police started investigating Dina, of course, and they found out that she didn't leave the hospital. And when she did, it wouldn't agree with the timeline where everything happened that night. So she was on the clear. Now they went back to Adam, which
which was the guy that was there at the mansion and he said that uh, he was okay to do a polygraph so they did they showed that in a clip while they were doing the polygraph and the question that they asked him in specific like if he knew who did it or if he was involved in that but apparently he the results were inconclusive which means that it's not like he lied or he told the truth it's just something in the middle which by the way will never be admitted in court because it's not a approved science or a you know it sometimes people get accused of horrible things because of this and not necessarily means that they were involved um, it's just something that they used to get an idea but not a hundred percent true so it understood that it was inconclusive and maybe that you know the guy was having a horrible time after everything that he saw and he had to do to help his sister-in-law when they asked the family they said that adam would be incapable of doing that to her or anybody he was a very well-liked guy and again not something that the family or friends thought that he could do to somebody However, one of the things that was very interesting is that Adam worked with boats. Apparently, he was a captain of a boat, and he probably did know how to tie the knots that she had on her back. However, the police at first thought that the knot was very, very usual, and then at the end, we'll find out that it was very not so easy to achieve, and this is well, when an expert looked into it and tried to different people to come up with the same knot but I'm not gonna gotta get ahead of myself however um, a few days later Max died so why would she kill herself you're probably wondering well a lot of people including the police believe at the time that she felt very guilty for what happened to Max even though he didn't die before her she died before him so, you know, that could have been it, but we'll have the statements of the family later on, and that will clarify a little bit more that theory. Now, on September 2nd, you know, this is seven weeks after Rebecca and Max died, the police got a, got a, a press conference Well, they were going to reveal, you know, their final um, findings, I guess, on both of the investigations. Number one, no foul play was on either case. Max fell and Rebecca took her life three days later. That's pretty much all the conclusion that they came out with. Um, they looked for evidence. They explained that they looked through every piece of evidence that they could find and uh, that what happened to them was something really sad, but nothing that involved some kind of criminal activity. Now, they also said press conference that they chose to ignore the claims of the neighbors seeing Dina or somebody that looked like Dina that night you know at the house and also that they chose to ignore the part where they said that there was a lot of loud music and then a girl yelling for help her family didn't believe it of course uh, they, they just couldn't believe that she would do that to herself and then under those circumstances maybe if she just hang herself but tying her hands tying her feet all those things were just things that didn't add up and I, I mean I agree so um, they went to the Dr. Phil's show where they explained that she wasn't suicidal that they did get a few messages from her that day and one of them had read it's a nightmare and partly is hard for me because I love him like my own but he's not and I need to be strong for Jonah so almost like she understood that this was a very bad accident and that she was suffering but she understood how much more Jonah and Max's mom was suffering at the time so it didn't seem like somebody who was suicidal now the show with Dr. Phil starts now where they're going to come back with proof and different things back and forth both families but uh, Max's mother goes to the Dr. Phil show as well and she explained that she consulted a uh, forensic pathologist and her name is Judy Melenik and uh, that this uh, expert told her that it was very likely that Rebecca was involved in what happened to Max that it wasn't actually an accident 
mechanics, um, the center of gravity for his height, and how high the railings were for the stairs, um, and how, you know, the kind of power that he would need to go over the banister to actually fall down the stairs. Um, apparently, later on, the police said that he was riding his scooter, and he came really, really
sexually abused with this knife or th with the back of the knife. Now moving forward to 2018, ABC, the channel, hired a private investigator to kind of reopen this investigation for them and try to find out different things that were not really dug back when this happened. Now this investigator found uh, quite a few things. Number one, the rope. It was almost impossible and this is something that the police said in the uh, press conference. He, they said that they didn't find any DNA in the rope on her, Rebecca, or anything like that. That all the DNA that they could find it was Rebecca's. Now, my question and, you know, this investigator's question is, how could that be when we know that Adam cut the rope, took her down, cut the, the rope or, you know, removed the knots from the, the rope that she had in the back and uh, check for check for the book. How is that possible? Did he use gloves? Because otherwise they could have said, well, we found Rebecca's DNA and we found Adam's DNA because he was the one that actually, you know, cut the rope or whatever he did to help her. That was a little bit interesting to find out that the police didn't reveal that information. Now, he also said that he did CPR on Rebecca while he was waiting. And you could hear the struggle in the 911 call and him uh, apparently doing that. But uh, there was no DNA on her mouth of him. Or at least the police didn't disclose that. They said that they couldn't find any DNA from any other person but herself. Now, the knot that was tying Rebecca's hands and feet wasn't a simple knot, and that is something that the expert found out. Uh, he, he conducted an expert on knots and stuff like that, and he actually went to different people, people that was in the boat industry and people that were not, and he asked them to replicate this, and, you know, most people couldn't do it. It wasn't one of the easiest knots to do, and even though Rebecca did have a little bit of background in boating, of course, she lives in an island, so she probably did a lot of these activities. This wasn't a very particular knot to maybe tie in a boat or something like that. This was a very intricate, kind of different kind of knot. So it wasn't the easy knot that people or police believed at the beginning and then told everyone about. Now, uh, another thing that he did was kind of a try to recreate what happened or how she ended up hanging herself that night and uh, apparently with the shirt gagging her the tied hands and the feet it would have been really hard if not impossible to jump off her balcony or the one that she did she did in order to kill herself it was almost impossible she was only 5'3 I think she was about 100 pounds and, you know, she could be very agile, but that doesn't mean that you can break the rules of, you know, and, and, and be like superwoman. It's almost impossible to do it. It would have been very, very hard for somebody as small as she was to kind of climb on top of the balcony area and jump to kill herself. Um, it also shows in that investigation that the balcony was so small that somebody could have placed her there, uh, leaned her against the, the actual rail, and then kind of push her off in order to uh, kill her or to get rid of the body and make it look or pose it after she was trying to kill herself. So maybe, you know, this wasn't, this could have been something that somebody did. The conclusion after this investigation is that th he did not believe that he, she killed herself, but he did not have enough evidence to prove otherwise. Now on April 4th, 2018, Rebecca's family proved that Rebecca was murdered, but this was on a civil court, not a criminal court. So they got $5 million in damages uh, because Rebecca was sending them money and stuff like that. But they actually wanted to prove that, you know, Adam was the one responsible for it. And they did. And I'm going to go through why they did. In this civil court, apparently the jury found him responsible, Adam responsible for her death in this uh, civil court because of a few things. Now, 
because of the investigation of ABC, a lot of new evidence came to light, and that helped a lot. One of them, the knife being bloody, and uh, it also the marking like she was grabbing the knife herself. She was grabbing the knife in a way that she was kind of hiding it in the back to cut a rope and make herself free. That was something that was explained by an expert, and it made a lot of sense in a lot of the jury's, um, you know, mind, and it, that kind of helped a lot. There is also, I mean, in that, in that um, uh, trial, or I don't know how to call it, but in that same uh, court, they also expose a theory where they believe that Max's mom, Adam, and Nina, which is the twin sister of Tina, had something to do with what happened to her. Could it be that they, you know, maybe Tina was upset and, you know, she put together something like this even though her son was still alive? That was the idea for them. Of course, they could prove that neither Tina or Nina left the hospital. So if they, in fact, had something to do with it, you know, what happened to her, it could have been something like a mastermind kind of thing, but it wasn't something that could have been proved because they weren't there. The only one that was there was Adam, so he was the one that was found responsible for the murder. This was thanks to the expert testimonies and everything that came out after, you know, that initial investigation. Now, the family wants Adam to pay for what he did. They understand that they need to move on or move forward, I should say, after Rebecca left them. But um, they also understand that he needs to be punished if in fact was him that did this. And I'm going to give you my thoughts. I mean, this is a very tricky case. To, and again, everything here is alleged. He isn't, you know, charged criminally for what happened, but I feel like this is a story that will continue to be open and that people will have to come back because I feel like there's always new evidence coming out of this story. However, I understand both sides, the sides that say that the police didn't do a good job in the beginning and the side that of the police as well. Suicide is something that happens more often than it should, they get to very, very, very um, horrible scenarios and, you know, houses where people take their own lives. So I guess that it's very easy for them to assume that it could be that. But I also understand the family side that because of all the evidence that they had, it almost felt like for the family like the police wasn't really helping them, but maybe the police were trying to cover up something. Again, this is very powerful people, very, they have a lot of money. The pharmaceutical business, it's something that it has a lot of influence everywhere. And I don't want to say that, you know, that that is why Adam is not in jail today. But there is a lot of people that believe that he paid off the police, that he had a lot of influences and he had a lot of people behind him to actually help him get away with murder, that it would have been almost impossible not to have any traces of DNA from any other person but herself, even if she took a shower, it would have, have to some have some kind of DNA or, you know, something from other people after being all day and maybe, you know, after spending some time with her brother-in-law and, and then all of a sudden the police is saying one thing, but it doesn't really add up because when she was found, she was caught by her brother-in-law and he, according to him, he did CPR. So how can you do CPR without touching the person? You know, I see both sides. I see the side of the police having to see these gruesome things every day. And I also see the family side. If I was part of the family, I, I 
just wouldn't believe it for one minute. I don't think any woman wants to get naked in order to kill herself. Um, hanging, and again, she and herself from a balcony that leads to a little patio in between the guest house and the main house. So it was outside for everyone to see. And then why would you tie your hands? Why would you gag your mouth? Why would you tie your feet? It doesn't make sense. If you're gonna kill yourself, you just grab the rope and you just do it. And, and then why would you make your life so hard by tying your feet, tying your hands, gagging yourself? It's almost like you're trying to uh, murder yourself. Is that, is that even possible? Is that something? just doesn't make sense in my head. I don't want to say, you know, he did it, or I don't, of course, I don't know. I wasn't there. But it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder how there's so much evidence that point in one direction, and all of a sudden, this was a suicide. Two deaths in the same house within a week. It just can't be a coincidence unless you believe in the supernatural. Let me know what you think. I would love to know your thoughts on this. And if you heard about this story or if there is something that you'd like to add, I'd love to read it in the comments down below if you care to do that. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day and wonderful weekend. And I will see you.